questions for the presenters to answer once they've had a chance to recover and have a glass of wine or, or a pint of beer as JR is probably doing right now. We will then post these answers to the website and we can send out um, the questions and the answers in a, an email blast. If this virtual call goes well, we can repeat this format in a month or so with updates from the other committees that were not represented on this call. Several key committees were not, and there are other interesting things that were presented at both ASCO and the ACR that we could follow up on. I want to thank Dr. Blanke, the group chair's office, Casey, Val, Courtney, Dana, the Hope Foundation, and many others who I'm sorry that I didn't mention, but thank everybody for making this happen. I will now turn this over to Dr. Blanke, uh, who will moderate uh, the meeting. Chuck. Thanks, Lee. That was lovely. I also want to welcome everybody, those attending live and those who are listening later. I am also grateful to the group that Lee listed, as well as Drs. Ellis and Graylo, who both came up with this idea and developed it. I do want to remind our presenters we are going to be absolutely strict on time. You will get a 30-second warning at 7 minutes and 30 seconds, and sadly, you will be muted at 8 minutes because we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to highlight their work. Beside the chat box that Lee mentioned, you should also feel free to send in questions to your committee chairs um, who can all collate all their responses and, as Lee said, publish them later. And as you heard, we are going to expand this and do this again if it goes well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Karen Kelly, who will give us the highlights of lung malignancies. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. Thank you so much. I'm excited to uh, give this presentation. If I could have the next slide. So it's really been an exciting time for lung cancer researchers and treatment. I want to point out that it is rapidly evolving. We had a record-setting month in May with seven FDA drug approvals for advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer, which is, is just so unheard of. Uh, and, and so exciting. I want to point out that four of those drugs are in molecularly targeted TKIs with cabmatinib and sulfurcatinib, the first two TKIs being approved for MET exon 14 and RET fusions. And this just echoes the importance of NGS sequencing as our standard sequencing platform. And as everybody knows, LungMap has been using this very uh, critical platform, the NGS sequencing, to screen our patients for LungMap substudies. And as these new TKIs come on board, we're now going to be able to enhance our LungMap platform and really start looking at some novel combinations. I think while this is great to have these new drugs, we know in SWOG and in the lung map team that we still have to do better with the TKI. So we're excited to be able to add now uh, additional actionable mutations and uh, look forward to additional sub-studies within uh, the lung map portfolio. We also have seen here three IO uh, agents approved. Most importantly, in May, we saw for the first time the nevo ipi dual immunotherapy combination, both as a uh, standalone and in combination with chemotherapy. And at ASCO, we did hear the first presentation of the Checkmate 9LA trial, which I want to talk about here in a minute. I also want to say that the unprecedented uh, treatment advances have also been seen in small cell lung cancer. We saw just a week or two ago in June the approval of lorvanectinib for uh, relapsed small cell lung cancer. And in March, we saw the approval for dervolumab. So it's not just non small cell lung cancer, it's in small cell, which is desperately needing more therapy. So exciting across the board for lung cancer patients. Next slide. So here is the schema for the Checkmate 9LA study. It was a randomized phase three trial looking at chemotherapy alone versus chemotherapy for two cycles only uh, with nevo ipi. The primary endpoint was overall survival here, and it was designed to detect a hazard ratio of 0.75 with a two-sided p-value. Now, the data monitoring committee 
uh, did confirm superiority of the chemo plus nevo ipi combination at the very first pre-planned interim analysis. And what I show you here is the analysis of the updated information. So at the pre-planned analysis, the follow-up time was only about eight months. And what I'm showing here is the updated at the 12-month median follow-up. And what you can see is the hazard ratio here is very impressive at 0.66. In the pre-planned analysis that showed the superiority, it was 0.69 with a p-value of less than 0 0.0006. And also to point out that PFS and objective response rates were also significantly superior for the uh, chemo plus nevo ipi combination. Uh, in the middle slide, uh, we're always interested now in the pd one expression levels and how people do by expression levels. You can see here that all, all patients do have a benefit with the four drug combination regimen uh, with those hazard ratios from 0.61 to 0.66. Now, of course, any time one has four drugs versus two drugs, you are going to see increased side effects. And we do see increased side effects with a four drug regimen here. But I think what's important to note is that there really was no increase in treatment related uh, deaths here. And I think as we learn how to use Nevo IPI um, as well, in not only lung cancer, but in other diseases like melanoma, I think we are getting more comfortable with the nevo ipi combination, uh, even with a chemotherapy backbone. And this isn't the first study to look at a four-drug backbone with two, two immune therapies. And, and so I think here, though, that having said all this, and this, this uh, has now been FDA approved, the major criticism of this study is that the control arm here is chemotherapy alone, and we know today that it's chemo IO. And if one does an apple to orange comparison, which we uh, say we don't want to do, but we do anyway, to Keynote 189, the chemo plus IO arm of that study, the hazard ratios are, I would say, comparable. I think that's the best that we can say here. And so I, I think that is it better than chemo IO? Uh, we probably will never get that answer because that trial will never be, be performed. Next slide. But we now have several options for our patients. We have a one drug immune checkpoint inhibitor option, a two drug dual immuno checkpoint inhibitor for those patients that are adamantly opposed to chemotherapy. We have a three drug chemo IO. We have a four drug chemo dual IO. And then we have the, uh, the chemo with a VEGF and a TISO. Regimen. So I think that this is great that our patients now have choices, but it's also obviously confusing and we are going to have to spend a lot more time talking about this with our patients and treatment decisions will be based upon clinical factors as well as PDL1 expression levels and other molecular factors as well. Um, I, I uh, not going to comment on the value of NG, the other relevant value of NGS in terms of non-actual mutations such as tumor mutation burden and SDK11 as, as some other examples there. But I do wanna say that um, there are still important questions to be addressed here. As patients are on their cancer journey, remember this is just their upfront treatment, we need to be looking at their whole cancer journey. And within SWOG has partnered with ECOG to uh, look at optimal timing of chemotherapy and immunotherapy in the Insigna trial in advanced uh, uh, non squamous cell lung cancer. And we have over about 200 plus patients on this trial. And so we would appreciate everybody uh, enrolling their, their patients into this, this important study for, uh, for the NCTN. Next slide. Uh, however, the most- morning. Oh, oh, the top uh, results are from the Adura trial, which was an early stage disease, which this was a trial that was stopped early because the data safety monitoring committee in an unplanned interim analysis showed uh, benefit here. And you can see that this benefit in the primary endpoint is unprecedented here at 0.16, the secondary endpoint as well, well tolerated, was uh, efficacious across all the endpoints. However, this has led to- apologies, Karen, we're gonna have to stop. 
Okay. But thank you so much. I'm so okay. grateful to you. And we are going to move on to hear about symptom control and quality of life from Drs. Mike Fish and Lynn Henry. Hi, this is, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Okay. Uh, so this is Lynn Henry. Um, Mike Fish and I are going to talk about some studies that were presented in symptom control and quality of life. We're going to focus on two that were actually SWOG studies, one that's related to a SWOG study and then one that we thought people should know about, assuming we have time. So on the next slide. Dr. Hirschman previously reported the primary analysis of SWOG 1105, which examined text messaging versus not in patients on aromatase inhibitor therapy to see if text messaging would improve adherence to therapy. In that study, patients had already been taking AI therapy for up to two years at the time of enrollment, although most had been on treatment for less than a year. And after three years, AI adherence was only 55% in both arms. Unfortunately, text messaging did not improve that. But this analysis um, is actually quite interesting. It was presented at a poster session, and she reported that patient-reported outcomes measures at the time of trial enrollment, so patients were already on AI therapy, were associated with long-term AI adherence. As you can see from the forest plot, increased baseline pain, increased endocrine symptoms, worse quality of life measures at the time of trial enrollment were all associated with increased non-adherence, as were medication beliefs. And the more factors a patient had, the higher her risk of non-adherence to AI therapy. And this really shows us that use of patient-reported outcomes, which are being increasingly collected in routine clinical settings, may help identify patients at increased risk of non-adherence and may also help us with designing trials of interventions in the future. Next slide. So this was a similar study um, that was using data from Taylor RX, which a lot of us participated in, and this was also presented at ASCO. So in this analysis from the trial, investigators assessed associations between patient-reported outcomes before starting endocrine therapy and adherence to endocrine therapy. This is actually a slightly different design from what I just presented from the SWOG trial. It included pre- and post-menopausal women, so not just older women, and patients completed questionnaires before they took any endocrine therapy. So in this study, 20% of patients stopped endocrine therapy within the first four years of treatment for reasons other than death, death or recurrence. So you can see the difference between a study that involves um, that's more of a clinical trial design versus more real, real life. High levels of endocrine symptoms, lower physical well-being, lower social well-being, and younger age, age 40 and under, were all associated with increased risk of early endocrine therapy discontinuation. So in combination, these studies really highlight that patients with higher symptom burden, even before they start a medicine, are at increased risk of discontinuing endocrine therapy. So it isn't just an AI toxicity of therapy issue that we're struggling with. So as we know, early discontinuation of therapy can result in worse disease outcomes, so this remains a very important issue to tackle and it's something that we are trying to continue to work on uh, within our committee. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Fish. Thank you, Lynn. We can go to the next, next slide. We're going to talk about uh, SWOG 1417 CD. This was a study from our Cancer Care Delivery Research Group led by uh, Vina Shankaran, along with committee chairs uh, Scott Ramsey and Don Hirschman, Joe Unger, and others. It involved uh, enrollment from across 126 sites, uh, uh, mostly our NCOR sites, and it was conducted um, between early 2016 and early 2019. So the issue is financial toxicity, and this is obviously a real and growing problem and it's experienced by people with and without health without. insurance. We know that uh, financial toxicity affects cancer treatment adherence and clinical trial participation, and those are real important to us and ultimately can affect quality of life and survival. So in this study, uh, 380 patients were enrolled and they, they had metastatic or recurrent colorectal cancer. And the primary endpoint was um, major financial hardship at 12 months. So this was the first national prospective cohort study to evaluate major financial hardship, particularly as a time to first uh, event kind of thing. And the punchline, as you can kind of see in this graph, is that uh, when you look at major financial hardship, it is really a cumulative real-world toxicity. So at three months, 
uh, major financial hardship was occurring in about 25% of patients. And it, it meant that one of these other five things, like new debt, new loans, income decline, refinancing a home, or selling a home, any one of those five indicated a uh, major financial hardship. And, and it just went up such that by, um, by 12 months, uh, it's 71.5% of these metastatic colorectal cancer patients had a uh, major financial hardship. So I think the implications here um, are that, you know, when we're looking at clinical trials, let's say the ADORA trial that we were hearing from from Karen, when you hear summaries like there are no new safety signals or toxicity was really manageable, um, you have to think about what that really means in, in a real world setting. You're not gonna be able to find major financial hardship coming out of the toxicity tables of a trial. But in, in real life, uh, think about this as a significant cumulative toxicity, particularly relevant for therapies where we're moving some expensive treatments into earlier lines of therapy. So people start to experience this cumulative toxicity earlier and uh, possibly uh, without established quality of life or survival data. And it also makes me think about what surrogates of real world toxicity we might uh, of major financial hardship, rather, we might um, be able to assess to, to understand this uh, as we move forward with some of the newer therapies that we get interested in. Next, this last study we'll mention is the Acufosin trial. It's an acupuncture trial that was presented by Dr. Wardley from the UK. So this wasn't a SWOG trial, but it's connected to uh, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, which is a major interest in our committee that I'll explain in a minute. Um, but basically, um, this is typical of a phase two-like study of a non-drug intervention in symptom management. Uh, typical in that you define the dose of the intervention, in this case, 40-minute weekly sessions times 10. You get clear about the technique, you know, they use specific points in the upper and lower limb. And you explore several different measures to get the feasibility and responsiveness of the measures. And you compare it to the standard of care and establish that there's activity and feasibility. So this is what happened here. The novel elements of this study that caught my eye were twofold. One is while they measured CIPN with common instruments like the CIPN20 and the ERO-TC QOQ C30, they used a novel patient-generated uh, tool for the primary endpoint. And they also summarized pessimistic sensitivity, where they took all the missing data and imputed a positive response to the control and, and a negative response to the treatment arm. So some novel, uh, novel elements there. And I think my eight minutes are about up, so I'll leave it at that and move on to the next one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fish. Uh, should I begin? Please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the SWOC 1211 uh, study on behalf of the investigators. This uh, study was presented as an oral presentation at SWOG. Uh, sorry, at advanced for meeting. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so, the SWOC 1211 study was designed at the behest of the NCI Milo Mastering Committee back in 2011 when I did not have any gray hair um, because there hadn't been any enrichment design clinical trials for high risk myeloma um, and we did not have any standard of care at that time. RVD was considered the standard of care for frontline newly diagnosed myeloma patients uh, at the time, and um, early data from Elotuzumab suggested a similar overall response rate for high-risk patients in combination with either a PI um, or an IMID. Um, so the SWOG 1211 opened its phase one uh, run-in portion in 2013 in September. Um, um, and uh, shortly thereafter, um, uh, the phase two portion opened and completed a year ahead of time. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the randomized phase two study was a one is um, uh, was a one is to one randomization with RVD as the standard of care arm, with eight cycles of induction followed by a maintenance strategy with all three drugs in a dose attenuated fashion. Whereas for arm B, elotuzumab was added to the RVD uh, for induction as well as for maintenance in a dose attenuated fashion. 
and therapy was continued until patients had progression relapsed or went off protocol due to intolerance, with primary endpoint being PFS, and the assumption being that we would be able to increase the median PFS um, uh, deemed to be two years in the center of care arm to 3.5 years in the RVD alotuzumab arm. We did allow one prior cycle of therapy uh, before enrollment, and, and that was um, knowing that high-risk patients may require therapy um, sooner. Stem cell collection was allowed after two cycles on protocol, but an autologous stem cell transplant was only allowed off protocol at the time of progression or relapse. Next slide, please. The definition for high risk uh, was based on one of these features. Patients obviously had to have newly diagnosed myeloma accompanied by one of the, uh, these risk features, either poor risk by gene expression profiling, cytogenetic fresh abnormalities that would include deletion 17P, translocation 1416, 1420, or amplification of 1C21, primary plasma cell leukemia, or elevated CNMLDH twice above the institutional upper normal limit. Next slide, please. A total of 134 patients were enrolled on the trial, and 100 uh, of the patients were deemed analyzable and eligible, 52 on the RVD arm and 48 on the RVD alotuzumab arm. And based on the patient characteristics, there were no differences between the two arms uh, that were statistically significant. Off note, uh, we had a significant number of patients who were equal to or over the age of 70, making up 25% in the RVD arm, 23% on the RVD alotuzumab arm. Next slide, please. After median follow-up of 53 months, there were no differences observed in the primary endpoint of progression-free survival in high-risk patients in the study. On the RBD arm, it was 32 four months. For RBD alotuzumab, it was 31 months with a one-sided p-value of 0 0.449. Next slide. At the same median follow-up, there were no differences in the overall survival either with the RVD elotuzumab arm showing a median overall survival of 68 months and, and that in RVD arm not being reached with a one-sided p-value of 0 0.239. Next slide, please. For overall response rates, the RVD arm had an overall response rate of 88% compared to 83% in the RVD elotuzumab arm. Again, uh, this uh, difference was not statistically significant um, and, and deemed to be similar in the two arms. Next slide, please. From the safety perspective, um, there were no major differences between the RVD and RVD alotuzumab arms, uh, either in the hematologic or non-hematologic toxicities in general, except for grade three or higher neutropenia infections and neuropathy being higher in the RVD alotuzumab arm with a difference of equal to more than 5%. Next slide. So in conclusion, in the first randomized high-risk multiple myeloma study to date, the addition of elotuzumab to RVD induction and maintenance strategy did not improve patient outcomes. After 53 months of median follow-up, the median PFS and overall survival in seen in both arms of the study exceeded the original statistical assumptions, which had been 26 months based off of the total therapy experience from Arkansas that included tandem transplants. So our, our conclusion was even though the study was negative, both arms outperformed the historical um, uh, data that we had. The overall survival has not been reached in the RVD arm, and that in the RVD elotuzumab arm was 68 months. These data support the role of continuous PI image combination maintenance therapy for high risk multiple myeloma patients, and these data will serve as a benchmark for future enrichment design randomized high risk multiple myeloma clinical trials. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice. The slides are up. Ken, you're up. We appreciate uh, everybody being on time and uh, look forward to this presentation. Of course. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to talk about the VESA swag at ASCO from a melanoma point of view. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, today, I'd like to highlight the work of two lead investigators, Alan Alagazi, uh, who reported results from S1320. Uh, which is a continuous versus intermittent dosing schedule of BRAF and MEK inhibitors. Um, this had data releases at both AACR and ASCO, uh, and in fact, the AACR presentation may have been one of the highly, most highly attended uh, virtual presentations of the year in melanoma. 
Um, Sapna Patel has continued work on S1801 um, and presented a trials and progress poster, but there are some things there I'd like to share about um, just our ongoing work during the pandemic. Next slide. Uh, so first, uh, I think everyone on the line knows that um, uh, melanoma is deadly. Uh, still 8,000 people are dying annually of the disease despite uh, significant advances. About half of the patients we see will have a mutation in BRAF, and the response rate to BRAF inhibitors is impressive with um, at least half the patients getting results like the ones presented here with uh, a very brisk PET response, um, which is uh, slowly followed by structural responses and actual tumor size. Unfortunately, those responses are temporary, with single-agent BRAF achieving only a progression-free survival of about six months. And with the addition of MEK blockade, uh, we extend that by some number of months in most of the trials where we've examined doublets. Um, we certainly have activity with CTLA-4 antibodies and PD-1 antibodies, but it remains um, important for us to try and optimize the use of targeted therapy in melanoma. Next slide. So um, this preclinical work uh, carried out uh, in part by Mark McMahon um, and colleagues shows that interrupting the dose of bemurafenib actually improved uh, progression-free survival in mouse models. So to walk you through the top panel describes uh, a cohort of animals, um, uh, tumor burdens measured along the y-axis. Um, and I think you can appreciate that uh, most of these animals are developing drug-resistant clones within about uh, 30 days of treatment. Um, if uh, the experiment's done with uh, drug interruption such that the bemurafenib is completely washed out, uh, they can maintain progression-free survivals uh, uh, for uh, two to five times as long as uh, is possible with continuous dosing. This translates into a survival advantage for the animals uh, in this experiment. Um, so looking at the uh, curve in the right panel, you can see that those animals that were on intermittent dosing were doing much better um, uh, long-term uh, versus those on intermittent. Next slide. So it was with this um, uh, experiment in mind and um, Really, to say one other thing about the uh, basic science behind this, there's a, a, a terrific series of papers on this, which basically describe the underlying mechanisms of how those interruptions help. Um, two things are at work. Firstly, the signaling pathways are uh, such that the cells over time, as they become resistant, in some ways become addicted to drug. And in fact, in some of the, the work done by uh, Mark McBann and others, they were showing um, growth advantages of cells under drug treatment. Uh, secondarily, you can imagine sort of a competition model within a tumor microenvironment where you would have coexisting uh, drug resistant and drug sensitive clones. And uh, maintaining a population of drug sensitive clones may actually compete out those that are drug resistant and therefore lead to lower populations over time of drug resistance. Um, so it was for those two main reasons um, uh, from a basic science point of view that we did this. Uh, the trial was straightforward. It was a 200 patient study, randomized one to one, uh, dual uh, um, uh, MAP kinase blockade with dibrafenib trimetinib continuously versus intermittent dosing with uh, tumor assessments about every eight weeks. Um, the drug holidays were approximately three weeks in length, um, uh, allowing sufficient drug washout, particularly of trametinib, which is the longer half-life drug of the two in the combination. Next slide. Uh, the study uh, uh, enrollment was balanced, and I think most importantly, um, the LDH, uh, um, which is probably one of the more important prognostic indicators in melanoma, uh, in the lower left panel was balanced between the two groups, so we knew we had more or less equivalent risk populations. Uh, next slide. Uh, and our results showed uh, convincingly that continuous dosing was better, so we did not uh, recapitulate what we uh, would have predicted prior to running the trial, but nevertheless got a result that we can inform therapy on, which is continuous dosing is the right way to go. And uh, I think uh, in the right panel, the overall survival being similar um, just highlights the fact that we do have good rescue strategies for patients at progression. 
And secondarily, it leaves the window open for future research of intermittent dosing strategies. And um, some ideas that we're considering are uh, 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 introducing drugs during the drug holiday to actually exploit the um, microenvironment and signaling changes that are occurring as a result of dual, dual drug blockade. Uh, next slide. So um, this is a trials and progress poster, and I'm highlighting it here because, um, and as, you, as you can imagine, our accrual to challenging studies um, uh, it remains an important uh, aspect of the work that we're doing in the pandemic. And this is one where I think um, we're really highlighting the discipline of the melanoma group. Um, so uh, this study, which is designed to show whether adjuvant therapy after surgery or neoadjuvant treatment with um, pembrolizumab prior to surgery uh, is better from a long-term outcomes point of view in melanoma. Um, this study is the largest ongoing trial of neoadjuvant therapy in melanoma, and it will answer a very important treatment question uh, in the field uh, when it reports. Um, asking a patient to participate is somewhat difficult because if you can imagine, this is a person who's coming to clinic with a large uh, sometimes uncomfortable tumor in the axilla or groin, and most folks want that cut out right away. And so for the investigator to explain that this is, you know, possibly by leaving this tumor, it's the, the bioreactor in which we're going to grow the white blood cells that ultimately will uh, destroy their cancer. Uh, it takes a little bit of um, uh, uh, coaching to encourage patients to participate. And um, so far we're doing well with our accrual. And the intergroup participation also has been very good. You can see in the right column uh, enrollments from Alliance, ECOG, Akron, and NRG. And this is really a, a credit to uh, Sapna's efforts as uh, a liaison person who uh, regularly attends the ECOG meetings as a SWAG representative and has uh, done a great job championing this trial and their calls and in, and in person when that was available. That's all I have. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Ken. Mm -hmm. Just a monumental. Oh. Any little feedback myself? Sorry. <laughs> now we're going to hear from the palliative and end of life care team from Dr. Ishwala Sumaya. Sure. Hey, everyone. Um, hope you're able to hear me okay. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to talk briefly about these supportive and palliative care studies. I'm just going to highlight a few that are, are particularly piqued my interest uh, at this uh, ASCO annual meeting. Next slide, please. The, the, the effort to do research within palliative care always starts with the quantifying something as difficult to quantify as suffering. So I always find myself going back to this position paper from MASCO back in 2009 that, that highlights domains of the cancer treatment experience. And inevitably, our, our research either falls into one particular bucket or crosses, crosses multiple domains. And so um, next slide. The, the, the first three studies that caught my interest actually fall in line with what was already discussed. And it, it really highlights the, the importance of how symptom management really falls into this continuum of supportive and palliative care that, that patients get. And so the, this feasibility study using this um, a digital medicine program is something that we'll, we'll, be, we'll be looking out for for the results. Next slide, please. And, and similarly for studies that um, the study that's centered around the financial hardship, the major financial hardship in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. And in, incidentally, in both of these studies, one of our uh, committee co-chairs, uh, Mark O'Rourke, has also contributed. And so these, uh, next slide, please. And so in the, in the context of the, the symptom management um, and the context of palliative care, we're very mindful of the studies done by our colleagues in the symptom control group. Next slide, please. And so when we move on to uh, palliative care and end-of-life care research, we're focusing uh, closer to domain seven, where we're looking at, um, uh, as well as domains two, three, and one in the next study that's presented in the context of palliative care for patients with an acute myeloid leukemia. Next slide, please. So in this particular study is, a, is, is one you think of in a, a more traditionally with palliative care studies, which is the integration of palliative care teams with the oncologic teams in the care of patients with one specific type of, um, uh, of cancers. And in this case, it's patients with AML. This is a study as a mass general group and where they looked at the 160 patients with high-risk AML who were admitted for induction chemotherapy. And they were randomized to either integrated palliative care plus oncologic care 
or to usual care. And the integrated care model that they, they studied in this particular study was at least two weekly visits by a palliative care clinician during the hospitalization and in all subsequent hospitalizations. And usual care was palliative care upon a, a consult upon um, request. And so in this particular study, the intervention arm with integrated palliative care uh, had 86 patients versus the usual care with 74 patients. Next slide, please. The findings that they demonstrated were those patients who did receive integrated palliative care with, with their oncologic care during their hospitalizations reported a better quality of life, lower rates of depression, anxiety, PTSD symptoms. This is in week two. And when they looked at more long-term, relatively long-term follow-up, um, the, the effects, the positive effects were sustained. And so they saw the continued improvement in quality of life uh, intensity of depression, anxiety, as well as PTSD symptoms. When they took a look at those participants that did eventually pass away, they noted that those who received uh, in the, the intervention arm, which is the integrated palliative care, were more likely to report discussing their end-of-life care preferences with their clinicians. And this is a 75% versus a 40% a staggering difference. Um, and similarly, those patients who were in the intervention arm with the integrated palliative care were less likely to receive chemotherapy within the last 30 days of life. This is a 35% versus 67%. They did not observe a difference in hospice utilization or hospitalization at the end of life. Next slide, please. And so the, the, the premise of better decision-making towards the end of life is, is a central principle within palliative care. And, and it, it, any, any, any uh, new fields that you see taking shape within medicine, we always wanna see, okay, how can it be relevant to palliative care? So in that context, next slide, please. We looked at um, this one particular study with particular interest, which looked at integrating, um, the effect of integrating machine learning, mortality estimates with behavioral nudges to increase uh, serious illness conversation Patients among patients with cancer. And so this, this is out of the, um, the group at Penn. And the premise, the main question was, can machine learning interventions increase serious illness conversations between oncology clinicians and patients um, to improve the uh, goal, receiving goal concordant care and end of life outcomes? And so this is among the first studies in this area. So it really lays the groundwork for solid data-driven interventions that, that we would consider within our palliative care group. Next slide, please. And so in this particular study, what they, they approached it as a Cephalage cluster RCT, and this was nine medical oncology centers in the University of Pennsylvania system. Oncology clinicians had received training using the Serious Illness Conversation Guide from Mary Adney, and the primary outcomes were the, the, the proportion, the number of serious illness conversations um, uh, versus uh, total encounters. And then the secondary outcomes included the advanced care planning as it was documented both for serious illness and, non, in, and within non-serious on this conversation. Next slide, please. So how did they identify the high-risk symptoms? So they used a previously validated machine learning algorithm that was presented separately um, that, was, that generated a 180-day mortality prediction based on patient data from the electronic medical record. And so uh, for each of the clinicians who were in this study, the high-risk patients were the six patients with the highest uh, predicted mortality risk per this algorithm who were scheduled to follow up with that clinician uh, within that following week. So it was really done in a way that didn't necessarily disrupt a person's practice. Um, next slide, please. And so the intervention was a weekly serious illness conversation email. And so this was a uh, performance feedback of the number of serious illness conversations over the previous four weeks, personalized peer comparisons, as well as, uh, importantly, a link to a list of the high-risk patients. Subsequently, the review, uh, this led to a review of the high-risk patient list for the following week and automatic text reminders on the morning of the appointment. Next slide, please. So the findings that they reported, the key findings were that the intervention, this intervention, which consisted of this machine learning mortality estimate, as well as this behavioral nudges, the text messaging to the oncology clinicians, increased the, the, the number of serious illness conversations by threefold over just a 16 week period. And so when they looked at the percentage, uh, how they determined this was the percentage of patient encounters that had a conversation documented on, um, uh, had an SIC conversation documented. So in the pre pre-intervention period, this came to about 1.2%. And in the post-intervention period, this was close to 
And you're looking at 10,000 encounters during the intervention period and um, 8,500 encounters in the pre-intervention period. And furthermore, in their intent to treat analysis, the intervention led to this, the, the findings persisted, led to a significant increase in the proportion of serious illness conversation. The adjusted odds ratio was at 3.7. Next slide, please. And so this helps, uh, this helps um, put some perspective on some of the palliative care research that was presented that was particularly interesting uh, for using novel modalities. Uh, I, I made the arrows a whole lot bigger because at the end of the day, you can see the continuum of symptom management when it comes, irrespective of which domain the patient is in, um, uh, how truly interconnected they are, especially when we're trying to uh, deliver, deliver palliative care. Next slide, please. And so uh, you can't have a conversation about palliative care without discussing coping strategies. So this is ours at the moment in Houston. So we're, we're, everything is fine and everything is fine. Oh, so <laughs> please e email us there. I, I, I can answer any questions or, or reach out in any other way. So I'll stop there. That was just fascinating material. We're gonna have our final speaker now from the Genital Urinary Committee. It's Dr. Peter Black. Uh, terrific, thank you. I wanted to uh, just focus on four trials from the GEO committee that were presented at, at ASCO. Two bladder, uh, two prostate, unfortunately no kidney ones this year. Um, three of them are related to correlative markers. Uh, so the first one here is actually a trial that I co-chaired with Parminder Singh, medical oncologist at Mayo Clinic. Uh, this is a single arm phase two trial in the BCG unresponsive setting. Uh, this is a registration trial, and, and it may seem odd to some of the other disease sites that a single arm phase two trial can be a registration trial, but this is a very difficult population to do trials in. Uh, it's a perfect population for uh, SWOG to focus on. And so the trial uh, focused primarily on the uh, carcinoma in situ patients uh, with or without papillary disease, but there's also a second uh, subset of patients with papillary disease without carcinoma in situ. Uh, all disease was resected, and then the patients had a tezolizumab for uh, one year duration, every three, year, three weeks for one year, and that was systemic delivery. The primary endpoint was complete response at uh, six months, and, uh, we're, and, and it was this primary endpoint that we reported on, and we're waiting for further follow-up uh, for the papillae tumors. Next slide, please. Um, first thing to indicate is that the FDA uh, demanded that we do a futility analysis since there's very little safety data out there around, around immune checkpoint blockade uh, in this early disease state. And our target was to have seven out of 25 eligible CIS patients respond, but we only reached five. So ultimately, the futility analysis, analysis was negative, but we'd seen an acceleration and accrual to the trial and nonetheless enrolled the first, the, the full CIS uh, subset, 74 eligible patients, where uh, 70 was the minimum target. We also enrolled 54 papillary tumor patients, uh, just short of the uh, 65 planned. So although it failed fertility analysis, we're still able to look at the primary endpoint. Uh, advance, please. Next. So primary endpoint, um, CR and CS patients at six months based on a mandatory biopsy was 27%. Uh, the target based on uh, a consensus between the FDA and the American Neurology Association was actually closer to 40%, so it was short of the target, but similar to a previous trial with Prembolizumab, uh, and Prembolizumab has now been approved in this disease state. Next, please. We also did a look at an unplanned look at uh, three month response rate since this was the primary endpoint of the Pembrolizumab trial, and it was very similar at 42%. Next, uh, if you can hit the button twice, I'm going to skip over that. Um, and then the toxicity was as expected 16% grade 3 4 toxicity, and we did have one treatment related death. Um, so we'll continue to. Uh, to um, prolong the follow up in this and hopefully with with a durable response, uh, this may be something that will go to the FDA. Next study, next slide please, it uh, was led by Seth Lerner and this is building on uh, 1314, which is a neoadjuvant chemotherapy trial uh, for, not, for muscle invasive bladder cancer. The primary uh, outcome was reported last year uh, at ASCO by Tom Flagg. This is a marker-driven trial. Uh, patients are randomized to GEM-CIS or dose-dense MVAC and the goal of the trial is to see if the coxin algorithm, which is a RNA-based algorithm, can predict response to chemo. Next, 
the results from from ASCO at last year basically showed that the GEM cis uh, coxin score or the dose dense MVAC coxin score that neither really predicted outcome in the specific arms of the trial, although the GEM cis coxin score did predict outcome if you pooled both arms. You see that in the third line of the table. So here, next please, the question was molecular, whether molecular subtypes could predict response. And we know from retrospective series that the basal subtype um, does relatively poorly without chemo, but very well with chemo. Um, so next, the, the uh, goal here was to see if molecular subtype uh, could predict response in the, in the pooled cohort next. And we used three different, uh, not we, uh, Dr. Lerner and the, and the group used three different classifiers based on RNA, RNA data. Next slide, please. And next, I can see the animation doesn't work well if you're not uh, controlling the slides yourself. But this, this um, table shows that if you look at uh, clinical stage and performance status alone to um, predict complete response or downstaging to non-muscle invasive disease, that you have an AUC of about 0.55 or 0.57. If you add in subtyping based on TCGA, the international consensus subtyping or the MD Anderson subtyping, you see that you see a, a mild uh, or a modest increase with the consensus subtyping for downstaging, but nothing uh, groundbreaking. And, and the coxin uh, predictors here didn't really add uh, too much. The limitation I would say is that the what we saw in retrospective series was that the there was a shift in specific subtypes with and without chemo. And of course, this cohort, all of them had chemo, so we don't necessarily see that shift, which is an important limitation. Next. And next, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to touch on two uh, studies. Next, please. That are molecular correlates uh, in the context of the um, S1216 trial, which uh, was led by Niraj Agarwal. Uh, this first one, this, this was an oral presentation by Amir Goldcorn. Um, looking at circulating tumor cells in this trial. The trial randomizes men with metastatic castrate-sensitive prostate cancer to LHRH uh, agonists plus, plus either bicludamide, the AR uh, inhibitor, or, or teranol, which is a CYP17 inhibitor, so a steroid-producing uh, blocker. Next, um, the liquid biopsy studies, so circulating tumor cells and ctDNA were an integrative um, correlative endpoint in this trial sponsored by a, an R01 grant. Next, since the primary endpoint of this trial, overall survival has not yet been reported, um, this was a limited analysis of the CTC counts at baseline, um, looking at two of the secondary endpoints, and they were limited in such a way that would not reveal any information about the final outcome of the trial. Next slide. So on the right here, we see PSA response at seven months, and in the, in the dark um, bars, we're basically seeing that a CTC count, um, a higher CTC count clearly uh, predicts um, higher or lower PSA response. And the next slide, we see that progression-free survival at two years is also predicted by CTC count. Next. So uh, basically, this shows that CTCs are prognostic, um, but there's a lot more analyses to do to see if it's also predictive and see if it can help with care. And the final slide is a study, and I have to get to this because it's our, our deputy chair, so it would have been too bad if I didn't, but looking at bone metabolism biomarkers in the same trial, and you can see a list here of the top two are bone, um, uh, are, are for bone, um, formation in the bottom two are bone resorption, and we see an enrichment of these burned bone metabolism markers in patients who progress before two years compared to after two years. The, um, one of them correlates with, sorry, with the presence of bone metastases, and the other three do not. So this adds potential independent information to help predict outcome, and again, it remains to be determined whether it correlate with the uh, primary endpoint and will actually be a predictive marker. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present. Thanks, Peter. I'm certainly not going to sum up the scientific findings today, but I do think we saw that our colleagues are doing absolutely amazing work. I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and pronounce our effort today a success. So again, I want to thank our tech folks, our speakers, and of course, all the attendees. 
I do hope we see you in a few weeks for an expansion of this effort. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.